Hi, I'm Carl Graff, and I'm a results leader. You're listening to ResultsLeader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. It's time once again for another ResultsLeader.fm. Welcome to the show. If you're new here, how you doing? <laughs> this is the show all about results. We're shining the light on the men and women who are out there getting results for their clients. And today we have Mr. Carl Graff. He's a sales trainer, a consultant, and an all-around good guy. You're going to hear it in this interview where he'll give us tips on growing talent, growing your bottom line, and growing your business. Let's jump in. Carl, my man, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Are you ready to rock this thing? I am, Jonathan. Good to see you. Let's give our listeners a quick win. What book have you given most as a gift? I'm going to answer this two ways. Let me give you the one from my personal life that I've given the most. That's the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, I'm a recovered alcoholic in 27 years and been fortunate enough to run across some people that were looking for some help. They didn't even have the money to get a big book. And I just felt what this is the book to change your life, to get you on the path to recovery, set you free for what you're going to. So from a personal standpoint, that's probably the book I've given the most. On the business side, the one I've probably recommended the most and given the most is a book of what to say when you talk to yourself by Shad Helmstetter. We've written a lot of books in our business, Sandler, but that book I've probably given the most, even though we give a lot of our own our books that we've written. But those would be the two answers I would say. Most hands down, big book of alcohol is not. I would like to know how long has it been since you've had a drink then? May 5th, 95. Damn, 95. Get it. Congratulations, brother. (laughs) Everybody tells me that, Jonathan. But if you watch me drink, you would have said, man, what's wrong? Can't you see what this is doing to you? So thank you for that. But when you step in front of an automobile, I mean, some, you stop. You I don't know if anybody would say, congratulations, not step for a automobile. But I get where you're coming from. It, 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 I've been very blessed. It's just one day at a time. And like I tell people, I'm just one drink away from being back where everybody else is. So I don't take it for granted. It's a gift. But uh, yeah, May 5th, 95. Yeah, man, I'm with you. Three years since I had my last drink. So I aspire to have a story like that one day. So speaking of stories, tell us a story of how an apparent failure set you up for later success. I'm going to tell you, I think every failure I've had set me up for success. So I don't know if there's one because I firmly believe it's it's failings how we grow. So I I don't know if there, I mean, failing with alcoholism, I mean, and not drinking, I think that's probably the biggest if we had to keep going back to that. But from failure standpoint, I have failed in business over and over and our business is the stronger every time from it. So I think it's a matter of the key thing. It's not the failing. It's what lessons learned can you take from that failure and how do you take that and move it forward so you don't keep failing the same way over and over. That right there. Now, I like the lecture. Now it's story time. So give me one of those where you had a failure, you took the lesson and turned it into something so that we have a a hard example. Let's just go right back to COVID. COVID, our business was decimated. 50% of our revenue went, went away in 30 days. Wow. That failure taught us to reinvent ourselves now. Because we are big into retain earnings, we were cash-wise, money-wise, we didn't have to close our doors, but we definitely were negative cash flow, and we had to we laid no one off through COVID, not one person. We got some PPP, but it was it took time to reinvent yourself because we had clients that were decimated. I had one client been in business for 30 years, debt-free. $40 million a year company. Their clients were hospital gift shops, hotels, and casinos. <laughs> gone. 90% of their business was gone. But the good news was they, so they had to stop using us. And they were a very good client. They didn't have a choice. And they, so we had a lot of that. So we had to reinvent. So what, what we realized is as market changes in our world, and I think anybody, your ideal client might change as market changes. We're getting right ahead into a recession. And anybody that's not preparing for that probably won't be around on the backside of it. So the ideal clients that have money in a down reset, in a recession, there are people that got retained earnings. In my business, we've been through 2001. We've been through 2008, eight nine. We've been through COVID. And every time we've had to find clients because we, um, we're a consulting, training, coaching business. People don't need us. 
But then when those times hurt, actually they need us most than ever, but who's got the money to invest in their people? So we're right now realizing that our market will probably change the next. I, I just was talking to some, we do a lot of work with P&Es and VNC companies, and they just told us right now in the next 12 months, there'll be 2 million SaaS salespeople on the streets, 2 million. So you know, those markets are probably not going to be looking for training the technology. It's a big field of business of ours, but construction, there's going to be a lot of businesses still B2B professional service, they still got to do business. So yeah, that's probably our biggest, our last was failing is learning to adjust through COVID. So what are you doing now? What are the adjustments? Because I'm with you. We're talking about this in our company about preparing for what's next. So we're ahead of the game. So what are some of the things that you're doing to prepare and to pivot? So first thing we do, we use a, we use a methodology called CARE, which is our strategic account planning methodology. Keep, obtain, recapture, and expand. So keep and expand are your clients. Obtain and recapture are your getting new logos or new clients. So the first thing we're doing is going back and redefining every one of those four buckets. What's the characteristics of an ideal obtained business coming through in the recession? What's going to be the recapture? Are there businesses that we've done business with in the past and now we got to go recapture because they're going to need us more than ever? Then we're right now evaluating our current clients. Some of our clients are not going to stay with us. They're not, they're not going to be able to stay with us. So we're going to realize evaluating those. So we're going to look at the characteristics they need. Do they have retained earnings, right? How big are they? Are they, for example, we don't, we do very little work. We do some with public companies because the first thing public companies do when the recession is they cut. I have a buddy that was, was Bank of America and he thinks that if a recession hits, Bank of America will lay off 20% of the workforce. So we've got to realize which ones are going to be able to, and then the other thing we're going to do is our service can be different. So now we're going to have to go in and do a lot of helping build what we call self-seen development. So part of what we do is sales training is just a small piece. We actually work on the attitude, mental toughness, dealing with rejection, how to recover from failing. So a lot of that's teaching the leaders, right, how to go through and manage that. So one of the key things as leaders, you've got to be what we call a chief affirmation officer. You've got to go in and pick up the attitude and give the affirmations to your team that we can fight through this. And 20%, 30% of the sales force can be cut. So all the salespeople, this is something I try to share with people when I speak, and I do a lot of pro bono work with salespeople. When times are good, make sure that you can not take that for granted. Meaning, can you sell in any economy? Because when the sometimes you might be just good and they need you because they need a body, but when times get cut, they're going to be the first one you're going to cut. So I always do all our sales leaders. We have this drill in our leadership program. Sit down with your team and says, if the economy changes in 90 days and I have to let two of you go, will you make it easier or hard for me to let you go? So the key is this, the salespeople, the customer care people, they got to be working like every day is a survival day, not out of panic, but by bringing the game. I mean, Michael Jordan, you got his best if they were up by 40 points. It didn't let the score dictate how he performed. Sometimes we let our revenue dictate how we perform. And if business is really good, we might have coast. We got to play. It's, those habits are whether your business is up, business are down. So those are things I think we, we look at going into this piece. Understanding where we right now, where can we take knowledge to, to be able to replace people? Not that we want to get rid of them, but anything we can take and get strain off the P&L from payroll so we can keep people. That was something that allowed us to do in COVID is what technology can we use? And that's why technology is still going to be driving. You know, technology, people don't realize technology is designed to replace people. So our best clients, you know what they do? They, they use technology where they can replace people. Then they hire the best and train the, their people to be the best on the streets, how to sell value. Right? Sales is not about features and benefits. Sales is all psychology, how to ask questions to let the prospect self-discover. So it's the same thing we teach, Jonathan, from a standpoint of getting in this recession is who's going to be our clients? And then what do we got to train them how to do? We work, we work with clients in four years, skill sets, staff, structure, and strategy. We're always evaluating those pieces. Strategy, right now, the strategy is going to be is how do we hold our business? To do that, what's the skill set our people got to have to hold business? Do we have staff that want to get better? What's the structure we need to have? Skill practice, sell, right? One of the companies that p companies don't do is they don't do enough skill practice. They don't do role playing in their offices. They don't practice before they go out. I mean, think about it. Even in our business, you're, you get on and you don't prep for this call. Right? We're all, we should always be prepping. You know how many people, people spend more time planning their vacation than they do their sales call. 
let's talk about bad recommendations. What are some bad recommendations you hear in your area of expertise? We don't need to grow our leaders. There's so many times where sales leaders don't get development. Just grow my people. The greatest threat to sales-driven organization right now is the sales leaders. The other bad advice that I, I would probably that we keep hearing is that sales training will fix it. 85% of sales training fails, and I'm in the business. Now, I won't tell you ours fail, but it does because training is not knowledge. Training is application of the knowledge. So if we don't hold people accountable, if they send it to us or anybody and they don't hold them accountable, it's like learn the playbook as a, as a football player. Well, you got to go practice the playbook because the playbook isn't going to execute itself. So I think that's probably in our industry, sales training fixes everything. It doesn't. So how do they stay accountable then? Who? The salespeople? The yeah, the Everybody. salespeople. I mean, are you going in there and saying, hey, you guys better do this and I'm checking on you? Or is it a culture that you're developing inside of the business? How does it work? Great question. So first of all, we sit down and talk about what's their goals and objectives. What's their vision? Where do they want to go? Why don't they get in there? Once we understand that, we then we do assessments. We're like doctors. We don't do surgery before an x-ray. So we have a what's called a performance gap analysis, a PGA, that we can go in and do an assessment of their people, both in sales, sales leadership. We look at their infrastructure, their sales enablement, CRMs, and we evaluate what we have. From there, then we will build a customized development plan that is implemented over years, not months. And the first thing is we start with the leaders. We don't do anything until the leaders go through first. Once we get the leaders, then we develop the team. And then we build some type of ongoing reinforcement plan customized to every company. So every company's got different things. So we build it. Then we come in and every 90 days, we're doing evaluations. We're looking at us. We're there looking at, we're looking at them. We'll come in and do what biggest thing we tell sales leaders do. Are you doing ride alongs with your people? Now, what I think is great about COVID now, I had, we had a sales leaders that tell me, you know what? Now I can be on four different sales calls in all over the world now that they could never be on because they can sit on a Zoom call or a Google. So they got the ability. So it's trust, but inspect what you trust, but inspect. So we now got to make sure they can do it. At coaches, all they're doing is they're looking at stats. See, what, what we're, we're no different than what we train as, as sports organizations, Jonathan. All they do is get the playbook, then they train to improve ratios. That's all it is. So we trained to improve ratios. Dials to conversations, conversations, book, appointments booked, appointments booked, appointments held, proposals given to proposals won. And then the biggest thing we do is retention of clients. You know, think about, I mean, we have, I have a client right now. If they keep their clients one month longer, Jonathan, think, listen to this number, one month longer, they'll add $10 million to the profit line. Good grief. It's a big company, but think about it, one month. See, people just don't, they don't realize little small changes can have a huge impact on organizations and do a little of a couple things, not a big thing of once. You'd be surprised how many times that we've never sat down with our clients and asked us, how, how are we doing for you? Think about that. How are we doing for you? They take the business for granted. They spend all the money to go get a client and they do nothing to keep it. Or we talk about the never, never customers. They never complain. They just never come back. So we, the biggest mistake we're doing now is training the people answering the phone. We spend all the money to get the clients and the person answer their phone runs them off. All right? We've, we've all been in those. And I don't even, we've all been had to reach out to, to some of these companies that they put you, don't, please don't put me on hold because you know you're never going to get out of it. So those type of things that we do to help from a standpoint of implement, inspect, look, we're invited. We sit at the board table with all those, and we're the, like almost at their board of asking the sales questions. We ask a lot of why. Why? What happens if you have the same revenue six months from now? You'd be surprised how many CEOs, very bright people, aren't asking enough whys. The number one question I ask when I sit down, oh, we're killing it. Why? You ought to see the blank stares I get into a CEO, why they're killing it. He's just happy he's got revenue and not, ex why? I said, well, if you don't know why you're getting it, how are you going to reproduce it next month? Now we're about to get into your favorite part of the show where we talk about results. But first, I've got to ask you, are you picking up what we're laying down here? I hope so. That's why we do the show every week. And I want to ask you for a little bit of help. If there's someone out there that you think can benefit from this show, why not share it with them? Put it out there. Hit the share button. Use hashtag results leader 
FM and get it out there. Now let's jump back into the interview. Let's talk about results. Why do results matter? Well, at the end of the day, it's uh, results. Money is king. Cash is king. But it's not only results on revenue, Jonathan. It's results on people satisfaction, client satisfaction. What results are we measuring? You know, what measure gets done? So it's what results we're getting. I think we look at sometimes we get into this, what I call, where are we tracking the right results? Meaning, are we tracking lagging or leading indicators? Results are great. Money's great. Revenue's great. But the problem with those numbers are what? They're lagging indicators. You can't change them. What results are, should we be tracking that we can change to have impact on the ultimate result of revenue? Right? So do, are we tracking or are we even getting enough meetings each week? Right? Because if we know, we know data. I mean, it's stats. It's reverse engineering. You want to get a sale which, and you want to make money. What's your average sale? Well, you know what a, a result that people aren't tracking is results in the pipeline. Do you even have enough in there? I was coaching a guy many years ago, and he told me how much he wanted to make because we believe you need to connect everybody to the goal so people can go to work for them and not go to work for a company. And I said, how much? And he told me, and I said, tell me, about, once that result, people never track your closing percentages. It's amazing. Well, how are you going to hit your number if you don't know your closing percentage? So I went through and I finally got to think about it. And I realized, I said, do you know you got to close 187% of your pipeline to hit your number this month? And he kind of looked at me. And I said, don't you see something funny about what I just said? You can only close 100%. So I already, now, I already know right now you're going to miss your number by 37%. And you don't even know that. And you know what? And I said, you know what? It's not your fault. And I called the sales leader and said, it's your fault. Your job is to help your people win. So there's a lot of results of making sure we're tracking the right results in a long about answer. Leading indicators. What data can we get quick so we don't have to crash the plane and still get right? Let's think. Over the last five years, what new realization has helped you get better results for your clients? Well, I, I think it's been more even important. The biggest result big is hire the right people. Secondly is, I think the biggest thing we realize is define a gold standard for your company. What's the gold standard? Whatever it is. And then hire to it. Everybody must buy into the gold standard, whatever that is, Jonathan. Is this culture? Are we talking about culture, like setting the culture before they come in so they buy into the culture? It could be the culture. It could be your department. It could be your belief system, right? We got people believe that our belief system could be is you got to buy into that. We got to sell value. Whatever it is, I mean, ultimately, you got the culture, and then you break it down from culture department to, but it's whatever the, the, the buy-in is, they have to believe. You have to help them believe. But I think the biggest thing we've recognized over the five years is make sure you, you really hire properly. The two biggest expenses in companies is mishires and doing unqualified quoting. Those hide in P&Ls. Those don't show up in P&Ls. Once you, uh, so once you hire the right people, now you can develop. Because what we know is high performers don't want to play with low performers, and low performers don't want to be with high performers. So everybody knows the standard. And then what we do is then we put the systems and processes in so they can be successful. Put the pressure on the process and systems, not the people. And the biggest thing I've learned, I knew it, but I just know it even more today over the last five years, is the difference between those are. Those that do and those that don't is discipline. They have incredible discipline to do it regardless of how they feel. I mean, if you really think about it, how many books have been written on getting successful? I can think of a lot. I don't know about you. You're probably been around this. You can think of a lot. How many books have been written on staying successful? Not many, right? So you go back and you have to find the people that are staying successful. Now, I, I'm not, believe it or not, I'm even that big of a team sports guy, but it seems that we learn a lot about what we do through team sports. So the two the guys that I see that can be successful, the guy by the name of Nick Saban, he does it, right? He's successful, wins more national championships, has the best recruiting. How does he do that? That's not just accident. It's not like he's paying his players. Everybody claims he does, but he doesn't. It's about culture, defining your culture. You be Sit down and ask people to describe their culture. It's amazing. What? Huh? And then they just grab at something. If, but if you went down to the next line person down there, tell about it, they, what, what, they wouldn't know. And I think going through this recession, and I think with these new generations, everybody wants to blame the millennials and the Zs, and we all got our flaws. But but the reality is, is we give them something they can sink their teeth in. Into. They just want to be successful. And if they don't think they can be successful with your company, they're going to move somewhere else till they can. 
they've watched their parents get decimated through 2008, 2009. So I think as we go forward, it's having that. And, and now today, everybody's got to buy it. Everybody's like, oh, work from home. I, you got you to gotta have that hybrid model, but you got to give them the system processes to make sure that they understand what success looks like. I don't care if you go to the gym and work out at noon if you don't have to be with a customer, but you might have to work till midnight at night to make it up. I don't. So those are just, I think, in the last five years, we've just seen those things even become more the front. And I've been in this business 23 years. We just got off a conference that we have every, three times a year. And I get off, every time I get off the conference, you know what I say to myself and my team? How are we successful? We don't know anything. How, how, how are we making it? I, I feel like I don't know anything. And you know what my mentor told me? He says, that's why you're successful. I said, what do you mean? He says, because you never, ever, you just are always like working and realizing you're always behind, not from a panic standpoint. And, I, and it didn't dawn on me. I just didn't know any different. I think what, what Henry Ford says, when you're through learning, you're through. And I think that he's, that was one of his quotes. So let's talk about your business. What area of your business would you like better results? Well, I think what we always strive for is better results for our clients, right? Meaning if our clients get to the results, they'll stay with us longer. I think the thing we got to realize, part of the reason to get better results is it's like recruiting. We got to make sure we get the right clients to begin with. But that would be something, Jonathan, we, we'd like to get better at. Obviously, we'd like to add more clients. I think right now we're looking at, okay, as we come forward, you know, who, which kind of clients will really need us through this recession. So we're, we're even looking at what that looks like. And I've had clients with me for 23 years since the day I've opened my doors. And, I can, I, and I've had some clients in the last two years, I've had clients I've had over 20 years and they've been acquired. So Berkshire's acquisition, I think that's going to slow down right now. I think I just read that p and is not investing in technology at all right now. They just shut the, shut the pump. They just shut the pumps down. What results are you most proud of? I think one of them probably, I've got a couple. I, I would say raising my daughter from the age of 13 by myself, I'm really proud of. And now she just four months ago, joined the family business, which was all by accident. That would be one of them. Meaning she was doing some other stuff and all of a sudden she didn't even like sales. She didn't even, and, and all of a sudden she got some stuff. She got involved, went for, to work where someplace that she'd left for nine years left and it was just a disaster. And she said, dad, what should I do? And I said, what have you thought about getting our business? So that told cool thing. So, and then grooming her. The second thing I would probably say is um, surrendering alcoholism meaning you can't need help or you can't need hope until you become hopeless. I thought I could control. So realizing probably I'm really proud of is that I realized I'm beat. I, it's like fighting Mike Tyson. And you keep him back up, right? And get your ass kicked. The key is stay on the mat. I thought I could get back up and win. Stay down. That's probably the other one. I probably, and then um, it's just, I, th- I, I would say those are the key. And then building this business and, and building it and changing because this business, what we love, this we change lives man we change lives now it's different we get sales but what you can teach someone how to make money and provide for the family and they can make money in any economy that's we're not about greed but but money's good you could do a lot with money we give to charities we without it you can't help anybody let alone yourself so i think those would be but in order of raising my daughter strike getting sober surrendering and and then getting in this business and changing people's lives give them give them a way to be self-sufficient I dig it, my man. Any parting thoughts for the results leaders who are tuning in to us right now? I think the big thing I want them to think about is it's not about you. Figure out what makes your people tick. Connect them to your goals through getting them to their goals. And then model what you want done. There's those that say, remember, I don't know about you, but when growing up, don't do as I do, do as I say, right? You shouldn't smoke as they puff on their cigarette, right? And then there's the ones that says, listen, let me go show you. Let me get in, show up early, be the first one in, be out. So I think that's the key thing. People don't give them a reason to want to play for you. Are you a leader because they're inspiring people? Or are you a, or are you a manager because they have to report to you because they're worried about getting fired? Big difference. Those would be the things that I've probably learned, both being on the sides. Because I got in this business by accident. I was a client. We needed help. In 97, I reached out to a company. In 99, I crossed the dark side, hired a CAO, hired a sales manager, and I became on the consulting side. And I ran my company from the consulting side. So I've been on both sides. I definitely don't have all the answers. Where can our listeners get more from you? Meaning when they they can reach out to either to the, they can reach out to me personally if they'd like. 
and they can do that either through calling me directly at 214-938-2732, which I'll give them my direct cell line, which people say don't do that, but I want to be accessible to people. Or they can email me at carl, K-A-R-L, at trustpointllc.com. Excellent. We will also include links and all the information in the show notes. Thank you, Carl, for hanging out with us today. Thank you, results leaders, for tuning in. Another show is in the can. That is a wrap for another edition of ResultsLeader.fm. If you are out there getting results for your clients and you want to be featured on the show, go to ResultsLeader.fm now and apply to be on the show. And if you love what you're hearing, share the show, give us a rating and review, do anything to help us get the message out there. Thought leadership is easy. But results leadership is hard. We'll catch you on the next one. This program is brought to you by thepodcastfactory.com.